Hello everyone, this is Blendrix, and welcome to the Blendrix Audio Academy uh, Freshman Seminar. Basically, the objective of this video is going to be to give you a basic walkthrough of all the functionality and uh, uh, sort of layout of Ableton Live. I'm trying to get this done in a sh relatively short amount of time, but uh, please understand that there is uh, quite a bit of stuff that we need to cover. So. Um, all right, without any further ado, let's get going. Um, probably the best place to start would be to sh tell you the differences between the different parts of the screen here. So we're looking at session view right now, and this is a, a template that I'm working on. I'm, I'm going to include a link for you to download this template in this video here so you can kind of follow along with everything I'm doing here. Um, this is session view. All these individual little spaces you see here are for launching clips. And those clips can contain MIDI information, which is what you're seeing here, MIDI notes. They can also contain audio samples, uh, which you can drop in from your library. Um, I'll show you how to do that as well. Um, the way that this screen is navigated uh, is by, well, you may mainly use this screen uh, if you're going to be uh, performing live. Or if you're using it to get the sort of the basic layout or arrangement of your track before you actually go into the next view, which is a range view, um, what this allows you to do is, uh, if you, for instance, if you've got a, a MIDI controller such as the one I'm using right now, uh, which is an Akai APC40, um, I can launch an entire scene of clips. So I'm clicking a little button over on my MIDI controller here that's going to basically press this play button, and it'll play all of the clips that are aligned in that row across. So I'll press the button now. And that's when you hear that. Now if I press the next button here, see how it actually launches the clips from the second row. I'm gonna go back. Then I can also go and I can launch clips individually, so I can be playing scene one, but I can be playing the clip two from drums. Or clip three. So that's how that works. It's a, it's a very um, nice system for being able to see kind of what your set is able to do uh, right off the bat, and uh, then you can kind of tweak around with different ideas of how you want to have it arranged and then if you get down to the point where you're like wow I'm even good at, I'm I, I like how this is sounding when I you know play it live then you can actually just press that record button and begin doing all of the playing of your individual instruments um, one scene at a time with your buttons and you know uh, exchanging the uh, clips in and out here and there and it will record everything that you're doing into arrangement view uh, the shortcut I just used to get into this view is tab, um, and it's the same on PC and Mac. You can also get there by switching back and forth using these buttons up here, but uh, the easy way to do it is with the tab. This is arrangement view, and this is the one that you're probably more familiar with if you've already used things like FL Studio, aka Fruity Loops, or Cubase, or Logic, or Reason, pretty much any other um, digital audio workstation, uh, the default that you're going to be used to doing any any um, song composition is going to be in this view. Um, but Ableton Live has this cool session view that allows you to kind of, um, it's a hybrid, basically. It's a hybrid of both um, live production performance and um, studio production. So uh, there's some really cool, powerful stuff you can do with that. So um, each one of these individual uh, channels that you see up here, these are not all individual channels. For instance, these ones that we're looking at that have this little arrow here, these are groups. So that means that within this, there's two separate channels. I mean, it could be more than that. It could be three, four, five, uh, it doesn't really matter. But um, this is a group of, uh, in this particular case, this is a white noise group. I've got, within that, I've got a channel that's uh, for audio samples of white noise, and then i got a channel for MIDI information for white noise. Uh, this happens to be uh, set up with a, uh, an instrument within live called analog, which is a, uh, it's a synthesizer that has a noise function built in, and I've tweaked it specifically to be able to make it, uh, here I'll show you what this does, um, that clip all by itself. 
And it's basically every time that you see one of those notes playing, it's playing that little that little bit of uh, white noise. So a lot of good places where white noise is useful in tracks. Uh, white noise is the building block for most um, percussion uh, sounds such as snares and hi-hats and other things like that. So um, one of the later courses I'm going to work on is uh, a basically a tutorial of how to how to design your own drum samples uh, from from scratch using synthesis, not just uh, using samples of other drum kits. So uh, we'll get to that. But uh, the, one of the primary uses of white noise in dance music is to help with making builds. Um, in this particular case, I'm, I'm using that as just a way to accentuate the existing drum pattern. But um, I'll, I'll show you how to make builds in a future episode as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, more information about the channels. Uh, in this view is a little easier to see what we're doing, so I kind of want to go through all the... Um, basically, you can play a clip by clicking on the little play button next to it. You can stop a clip uh, by clicking a little, if it's a little square button there. Um, if you want to stop the entire channel's clips, you hit that little square button there. These are um, send knobs, which means that any any signal that's coming out of this channel gets sent to the return channel that's labeled with the same letter. Over here we've got return channels labeled A, B, C, D, and E, and then one that's for FX. Technically they all have effects on them, uh, but I wanted to uh, set up this one over here so I could give you a, a demo uh, of all the different effects. Well, not all of them, but most of the important ones um, in live. So we'll get to that in here in a little bit, but um, I want to finish talking about the way the channels are set up. Um, so in this case, um, I've got a delay, a short delay. Um, and there's This one's a long delay. Uh, if I were to say I wanted to have a... Um, a delay on my drum kit and I wanted it to sound now oh, here we go I'll just play this watch what happens if I crank up this that's a short delay now I've got a long delay set up on the B it's a slightly different um, timing on the delay so uh, you can play around with the different settings on that, and, and all this is included in the template that I'm giving you. So try playing around with the different uh, settings. Basically, the only difference here is between uh, f uh, quarter notes and uh, six notes um, delay time. Um, I'm sorry, uh, four beats versus six six beats. Um, and then you've got the, the dry, wet, and feedback um, that you can adjust on there as well. Um, this is a reverb, so I could turn this up. That's a short reverb, so it's designed to sound like a small room. Um, this is going to sound much more like a stadium or a large concert hall. But you can adjust all the settings with this stuff to really give you a um, fine-tuned control over how you want that room to sound. But what's what's best usually is a some combination of the two of those. You know, something like that gives you a nice balance. Um, the E, uh, this is the exciter. This is basically, um, we've got a, we've got a, um, uh, saturation plug-in on here, uh, that we can use to see what happens there. It's basically, it's adding a little bit of sort of tube, just, well, I don't know if I would call it tube distortion, but it's definitely saturation. It's, and it's turning up the warmth. It's, it's adding some, um, harmonic distortion. And that really has a tendency to make things like the snares pop a little bit more. Um, so I definitely will almost always have some exciter um, on at least part of my drum kit, usually on the higher parts of the percussion to make them really pop through the mix. Um, but that's what this, these uh, send knobs are. They, they give a... Um, they let you turn up the influence of more than one set of uh, effects on your on that channel at once. The really important thing about this though is that the way that this is set up, if you've got delays and reverbs tend to be somewhat processor intensive and if you've got those all on um, 
like if you got a if you got a reverb on your drum channel and you got another rev another reverb on your um, lead and another reverb on your bass and another one on your you know if you have a separate percussion line, as you can tell after a while you would begin ha um, it's it's basically the you're putting a processor through a lot more work than it necessarily should have to have so. Um, the more efficient way to do that is to have these uh, return channels set up with the effects that you know you're going to want to apply on pretty much all of your tracks to a certain extent and then um, pass those effects through um, these return channels and, and basically using these, these send knobs to achieve the appropriate mix there. So, um, alright, that kind of covers that portion of things here. Uh, these buttons down here, this is what turns the channel on or off, basically makes it sound or not. Um, you can see there's a few of these that are turned off already and I'll explain why that is in a few minutes here, but um, that can help you um, troubleshoot if you, if you need to. Solo, this means if you've got more than one thing playing at once, for instance, I'll go ahead and play that scene. Solo plays just the section that is highlighted. You can also hold down Control or Apple on, on an Apple machine and uh, get both of them going at once. Same thing goes for these buttons down here. These are called the arm button. And what that does is if you're using a MIDI instrument to play, um, for instance, this is my I'm using my MIDI keyboard here to input these notes here. And if this arm thing isn't turned on, then I can be pressing those keys and nothing happens. So that's you'll see that this little all channels, that's the MIDI signal and it says, "Oh yeah, I'm getting MIDI signal, but the track isn't armed, so it doesn't make any noise." So, that's kind of how that works. Um Let's talk about, uh, this is uh, the, the track delay. This would be for if you have some latency issues that you're struggling with and, and getting all your tracks to synchronize properly. Um, most of the time you don't even need that turned on, so in fact I'm going to hide that since it's not really that important right now. Um, let's see. Oh, this knob here is the uh, pan knob for that track. So if I pan it all the way to one side, as you will hear in a sec here. There it is all the way over on the left side and all the way over on the right hand side. And you know, the easy thing to do is just keep it in the middle. And then you can actually set up a, um, you can use panning on a plugin on the channel and automate those parameters as well. This is more so along the lines of if you were going to be, um, say you had two different guitars that you wanted to be playing and one of them and you wanted to be kind of in the left ear and the other one you wanted to be kind of in the right ear and they were going to be playing like say octaves apart from each other, you could basically set the default, you know, to, to the first one as being, you know, a few points off to the left and then the other one being a few points off to the right and, and not really have to mess around with additional plugins that way. But other than that, you shouldn't have to mess with these uh, pan knobs too much. I'm going to go ahead and stop that clip so we can hear ourselves a little better. Uh, so a little bit more in the uh, automation lanes over here, I guess it, I should say in arrangement view. Um, some things that are unique to this view are um, these little pink lines you see coming across the screen. Those are what's called automation lanes. And you can change parts of what's going on in that and what's playing, you know, if, if you're talking about using this this timeline here as uh, as what you would normally do in, in a digital audio workstation and your, uh, aka a DAW, by the way, so you hear me say a DAW, it's short for digital audio workstation, D-A-W. Um, so that out of the way. Uh, for instance, uh, let me just give you an idea of what, what that would look like. So I'm going to tap back over here and I'm going to grab this first drum sample. This is a, uh, a another good shortcut to know how to do. Um, you click on any clip that you want to drag over into that arrangement view and you hold down that mouse button and when you press that tab button it that that clip comes with you. Um, I'm just going to make sure that I drop this in the appropriate lane. And here we go. So um, I guess this is a good point to tell you about the other functionality of the arrangement view. 
This bar up here that you see me moving around is a loop bar. Uh, the width of it is the entire width of the loop that the system will play if this is highlighted. That means the loop is on, that means it's off. All right, so that being on, get back to the beginning, and you can see it will, let's see, this, this is the, uh, when that is pink, it means that the, uh, that there is differences between what you see here and what is playing over here. Uh, I just basically cleared those differences by clicking that button. Um, so you can see it's now looping. It is going back and playing the same part over and over again. Um, cool thing I can do with the automation lens, just to give you an example of how this works, is I'll do that I'll do track panning. So basically what I'm doing with that, you know, I'm, I'm adjusting the pan based on time position of the track, but you could do that with anything. Any effect that's on this channel, any of these knobs here, for instance, I can change the delay amount, I could change the reverb amount, and if I right click on there, I can actually go to show automation and it'll show me the automation for that parameter in here, and it doesn't show it in that drop down immediately in, until you've actually activated the automation for that. Um, but as you can see, there's there's a lot of things you can control with automation lanes, and that's what really gives you the opportunity to uh, make some really complex and um, interleaved uh, kind of soundscapes uh, that are constantly in, evolving in your track. So, highly recommend learning a lot about those, and uh, I'll probably give some more detail on that in another uh, video as well. So, okay, so more about navigation and how to use this screen here. Um, you can click and drag things around. If you've got an existing clip and you want to do like more of that clip, there's a, there's a couple ways you can do it. First, you can, um, this is the full length of this clip. If I Right, click on the right side of this and drag it out where that bracket is. It's basically making you see that little those little dimples there. What that's indicating is that 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 clip is repeating twice. So if I make a change in here, and let's say I remove that first kick from there, I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can kind of see it. Actually, let's do something a little more noticeable. So this first hi hat, you see where it shows up there. If I the way that this is done is repeating. If I double click this, see how it disappeared from both here and there? And when I add it back in, it goes back in to both parts. And that's because it's a duplicate, it is, a, it is an exact, and, and they're linked together. However, if I want them to be different, I can duplicate it. And that's that's Apple D on a Mac, Control D on a uh, PC, and it'll duplicate that portion. Now, if I make a change in here, notice how it doesn't remove that from there. So that's one thing to keep in mind. It, it's uh, it's nice to have all your clips separated out like this um, because it allows for a lot more variation. And I can say with certainty that. 80 to 90 percent of the time more variation in your track is good um, it keeps the song flowing well it keeps it as a story that's being told rather than just the same sort of thing looping over and over again I highly recommend making your drum patterns uh, unique um, over time you know adding and, re and removing elements to, to keep things fresh so but you can duplicate them uh, for instance if you got a really good pattern that you know okay well I want to expand on this uh, duplicate it and then go in here and then add some more stuff and then duplicate that once you've finished with that and then add some more stuff or subtract a few things and add some other different things um, but that's that's how that works um, so clicking and dragging um, let's see uh, all the same shortcuts for copy paste um, and and cut they're all the same uh, 
an Apple C, Apple X, and Apple V, or the control equivalent of those uh, for um, all those copy-paste um, operations. Let's see. Um, you can see this part where it says duplicate or duplicate time or delete, delete time, um, cut and cut time. The difference between cut and cut time or these other ones here is that if you if you duplicate this by itself here, for instance, let me actually just go and grab another um, clip so you can see what I'm talking about here. I'm going to drop this in on the base channel where it's supposed to go right along with this one. Okay, so if I duplicate this by itself, what it's going to do is duplicate it just like that. And if I were to already have something over here like this, and I duplicate this, it overwrites it, which you can always undo if you need to. But there's another nice thing you can do. It's called duplicate time. When you do that, it takes everything that you were working on in that section, all things that are in the same highlighted field as this. So, for, so including this, basically whatever occupies this same time sequence on the arrangement view, it will duplicate that all the way over here. So that's really, really helpful if there's a section of a track that you need to expand or remove from, uh, and you don't want to have to deal with trying to move everything around to try to uh, make room for or to take up the space left by it. So as you saw right there, I deleted this, but that left this sitting all by itself. If I needed to, say, get rid of this section of the track saying, oh, you know, that, that intro is too long, I can do edit, delete time, and it removes everything that occupies that same time um, section in the arrangement view. So very, very helpful tools for uh, arranging your tracks. Um, let's see. Obviously, playing everything from the start. Clicking the square stops it right where it is, but it doesn't actually stop. If, it, if I hit play, it'll go back to the beginning. But hitting stop leaves that line exactly where it was. So can be helpful if you're playing along and you say, oh, I need to fix something right there. You hit the stop button, and then that line will remind you exactly where you were. Um, hitting the play button, again, starts it from the beginning. Um, this little tool here is the pencil tool. Uh, basically, the difference with this is that it's going to draw things in as straight lines that are uh, perpendicular to the um, beat divider lines and they're they're going to be it's going to be a solid line in between wherever that line those those uh, vertical lines fall so in this view you know it's it's broken up into four as you can see it kind of is set to, to square patterns All right um, but if I were to zoom in more and now there's a bunch more of these vertical lines it's given me a little bit more detailed view and I can get a lot more specific on it this is still a very um, it's going to give you very harsh uh, sounds if you change parameters using these steppers like this um, especially things like filter sweeps and stuff you don't want your filters to be stepping up like that you want them to be rising or falling gradually um, so you would do that by turning that pencil tool off and if you double click on that automation line it creates a node and you can drag those nodes around you can click and double click and add more and if you've gotten to the point where you've got a bunch of these nodes and you decide oh, you know what I need to get rid of pretty much all of those you hold down the shift button and click on one of them and then you drag it through the others and they will all disappear and double clicking on them makes them go back away as well. A couple more things up here that we need to cover. Um, the overdub, this, um, as it implies down here in the info view, oh, this is another nice thing to know. By the way, if you hover over anything in live, if you don't know what it is, that little thing down there will tell you what it is. So this is the thing that tells you the arrangement position, overdub. 
Recording applies to MIDI clips when the overdub switch is on. Existing notes in a clip will be mixed with rather than replaced by newly recorded notes. So if you're recording uh, a MIDI clip using, say, a uh, MIDI keyboard for writing a synth line, or if you've got, say, a MIDI drum pad and you want to be able to kind of record your um, the beats you want to make live uh, because you kind of want that more human feel, then having that overdub uh, button turned on or off has a big effect on whether... The say if you're recording in a loop, when it comes back to the beginning of the lo that loop, does it begin overwriting everything you've already done, or does it allow you to kind of put more notes in on top of what was already recorded? So, um, good thing to experiment around with. Um, up here, having this little thing uh, turned on means that if you're using, if you have a, uh, if you have a computer keyboard, you know, uh, QWERTY or any, or otherwise. Um, you can actually use that to play any of your um, any of your instruments. I'm actually playing that on my computer keyboard here, um, not on my MIDI keyboard. So it's a nice thing to have. It's really not a great way to play notes, but it's better than having to key them in manually or double click them in on your um, on your piano roll, which is uh, this little guy here um, that can be it can be a good way to move things around if you decide that you're more comfortable with looking at a pattern uh, visually and, and moving things around but um, I find that it ha it's it's nice especially if I'm um, producing on the go and all I've got with my is my laptop uh, it's nice to have that turned on because it lets me uh, put those notes where I want them and kind of come up with chords that I think sound cool because uh, it's really hard to make chords live using your mouse. <laughs> um, see, this is showing that I've got MIDI signal coming in, and it's because I have this uh, this MIDI keyboard plugged in, and basically it's always sending its MIDI clock information uh, and information about its um, mod wheel position, which is what you're seeing down here uh, as I turn that up and down. But basically it's constantly sending that, which is why you're seeing these little lights kind of going bonkers all the time. Um, this little guy here is a, is a, is a, oops, <laughs> if you click on it, it turns off your audio interface. Uh, that is an indicator of how much CPU I'm using uh, right now. And part of the reason that's up as high as it is, is because of the fact that I've got a bunch of different effects already queued up in here to show you how to use uh, once we get to that point. So um, they're fun and, uh, I wouldn't recommend having them all turned on like this at any point in time because you're going to end up using a lot of CPU or that you would not need to use, um, especially if you're if you're not using them at one particular point in time. You can always automate your effects on and off using the same automation lanes we talked about before, um, and only have them turned on when you absolutely need them. So, okay, uh, so that pretty much covers all of the. Um, oh, this is a, this is kind of nice. This is a um, metronome. Basically, it helps if you're if you're recording a track and you want to be able to uh, give yourself a better handle of where the beat falls. For instance, if you've got a, a, a drum portion that doesn't have a, a kick drum or a snare drum or, or the other things that are sort of used to determine exactly where that beat is falling and you want to be able to keep time, that uh, that you'll hear it now, actually. So you can hear that it's uh, it makes that um, the higher note on the downbeat uh, on the one, two, three, four, and a one, two, three, four. It's a again nice thing to have. Um, moving on. Oh, I guess we kind of got into this a little bit, but uh, didn't didn't really finish with it. Um, so more with the arrangement view and manipulating stuff within the, the arrangement view. Um, as you can see, I'm clicking on this this bar up here, and as I drag the mouse down, it zooms in on the portion of the timeline that my mouse was clicked on. So if I click over here, it's going to zoom in over there. And over here, it's going to zoom in over there. 
up here, this is basically telling you, this is kind of like a magnifying glass saying, all right, overall, this is the view of what you're looking at. You can use this as a zoom tool as well. It tends to be a little bit more extreme, a little more drastic. Uh, you can get a lot more done with a single mouse stroke that way, but this is a little more precise, more surgical. Um, let's see. Uh, the If you wanted to play a particular portion, say you've made a bunch of this stuff and you're playing the track, you've got the track all the way out in here, and you've got, you, you want to just resume play right there. You don't want to have to listen to the entire intro again. You just click exactly where you want to begin playing and it'll play there. More clip manipulation. Um, we can split a clip by doing a control E or Apple E and it will split what we're working on. You can split them again. And as you can see that down here it actually shows that you could still expand that clip back out and make it whole again. But most of the time, if you're splitting them, you have a reason to do it. So you can right click on it and um, you crop the clip. And then it's going to only be that section. Makes it a little easier on you if you're, especially if you're doing um, clip envelope automation, which is where you add automation just like you've got up here but that's tied specifically into the clip and that's with this little E button down here you turn that on and it allows you to automate parameters. We'll get to that more later. Um, to rejoin these clips uh, say you've made some changes to the individual parts of them and now you want to bring them all back together you select them all the hold down the shift button it allows you to um, select them all same way as most computer programs. And then you can consolidate them. Um, that's Apple J or Control J on the PC. And it puts them all back into one clip together. Okay. Um, you can rename these clips. I find that to be a very helpful feature, especially if I'm looking at my track really zoomed out and I've got 10 or 15 different drum patterns that I'm going to be choosing from and I'm going to be um, selecting back and forth. Having them labeled with their different roles in the track makes it a lot easier to, to know where to put them and it makes it a lot easier to say, okay, well, I want that drum loop I was using earlier in the track right around the, the drop. Okay, what was that called? Oh, drop. You know, I could call this intro and that's those are intro drums and my other drum loops over here you know I could rename these um, that could be drop that could be chorus um, you can rename them by doing control R or Apple R and it uh, allows you to go in there and rename them there as well um, that's a good thing for organization purposes uh, another another thing to know about um, the arrangement view in particular and um, something that's important for keeping your CPU usage down is uh, the ability to freeze tracks. Uh, basically once you've already gotten something put together and you know that you've got it the way you want it you can right click on the track and go freeze track. And it then basically makes it so that everything that you've already got there stays the same way. It keeps all your settings exactly where they were, it keeps all your automation exactly where it was, it basically is is kind of um, taking all those things and it's, instead of allowing them to be uh, modified on the fly, it's locking them into place and that um, basically relieves some of the uh, CPU usage. So I'm going to unfreeze that track. A couple more things. Um, it's good to know how to, how to change things around with your um, the grid. Uh, I like to use the narrow function on the adaptive grid, which means that uh, as we zoom in and out, it will give me more or less uh, grid bars to play with. Um, narrow is, is a nice, easy, I would say you know, almost a one-size-fits-all 
sort of scenario. Um, occasionally, you might need to go down to narrowest if you need to be m m moving notes around uh, on a more minor scale, or not minor scale, but uh, on a more delicate or precise scale. Um, for the most part, narrow is is a um, will will suit you just fine for your um, ninety five percent of the time. Uh, you can also set fixed grid though if you're if you're really into having your grid be exactly. I mean, this is really painful on my eyes, but uh, I guess some people like it that way. Um, I like mine to be adaptive and just give me as much as I want with the zoom uh, level. Another thing we can do is we can add locators. So this is a right click menu up here. Uh, basically the reason this could be useful is because if you want to be able to, um, if, you're, if you're working on a long arrangement, such as uh, say you're making a 20 minute continuous mix, and you want to be able to say um, jump back to a specific point in the track you can add a locator and you can give it a name you know for instance with this one I could say this is the drop and then whenever I want to go back to the drop I can just click on that area there and it'll start playing right from there so it's kind of easier easier way to kind of keep track of where everything is in the in the track sort of housekeeping stuff. Uh, I wanted to give you a sort of a rough tour of the browser that is built into live. So this little arrow here on the side expands and collapses and you will find that is the case with pretty much any one of the things around on this screen. If you've got a little button there it's probably going to expand or contract various different things around the screen. I can basically move all kinds of things around. So I find it helpful to keep the browser open most of the time because it's it's something I need to get into pretty frequently. Um, this first one here is devices that are built into live. So the first one is instruments and these are all ones that, uh, that either come with live or come with live suite. Um, for instance operator comes with live suite but uh, but doesn't come with standard Ableton Live. Um, you'll get analog and, and a few other things. Uh, drum rack, I believe, comes with everything. Um, and a few other ones in here are, are pretty standard issue. Uh, Max is a, uh, is a special plugin that's designed for uh, people who really want to get into the nitty gritty and basically design their own instruments from the ground up. Um, it's a very, very powerful tool, uh, but it's also very, very geeky. <laughs> uh, if you find yourself being the kind of person who likes to write shell script <laughs> and uh, you like tweaking your own uh, JavaScript code and things like that, You this might be the kind of thing you'd like to do. Uh, but for most of us, it's the kind of thing where having it installed allows you to use instruments that other people have designed and uh, basically made available for public download. Um, it's a nice way to expand your library without having to pay extra uh, for each individual plugin that you get. A lot of times people are releasing these for free. So. <clears throat> Again, these, these are all instruments that you can drag in and put on your channels down here, uh, and they're the ones that are built into live. These are MIDI effects. Uh, these are effects that are going to be applied to MIDI notes. So you wouldn't hear the effect itself, you would hear how that effect is applied to MIDI notes. So using the arpeggiator takes a single MIDI note and turns it into arpeggio, which is basically a, a uh, somewhat randomized or patterned series of notes that sort of follow along a chord progression uh, that you specify with the arpeggiator. So we can get more into that in a future lesson. Uh, we won't really co cover that in here, but uh, that's what MIDI effects are. Audio effects, these are ones where you're actually going to hear an, uh, a, a significant change in the way the audio sounds when you're playing audio from a channel through one of these effects. For instance, uh, a chorus effect. It's very similar to a chorus effect on a guitar pedal, if you've ever played guitar. Um, same thing with, uh, there's a distortion, there's a compressor pedal, uh, not pedal, but uh, compressor effect, phaser, reverb, saturator, um, we'll get into all those things later, but again, these are all the ones that are built in, they're called lives devices there. This little plug here stands for plugins, so third party plugins you've already installed on your machine, they will show up here. On the Mac, you're going to have options for audio units and VSTs. Uh, PC, you're going to see the uh, VST side of things. 
Um, and here I've got all the different um, plugins that I use um, as, as VSTs, and this is on the audio unit side. Typically, if you're on a Mac, um, audio units are going to be a slightly uh, better performance because uh, it's more optimized for the operating system. So if you can get your plugin to work as an audio unit, you'll get better CPU utilization uh, with that. So these next three windows here are a folder in your file system where you leave them. So if I put this and I have that one highlighted and then I leave it and I come back, it's going to be right where I left it. Same thing with any of these. I leave my first one open to the swing, uh, the groove pool with the swing, because that allows me to easily drop some of these default swing settings into the groove pool, which allows for swung beats. We'll get into that in another tutorial, but uh, that's why I leave that open, because I, I like to play with swung beats a lot, so having that handy is nice. This is a, uh, another, another folder I've got on my computer. This is a drum sample library for a bunch of different drum machines. Um, and then this one is, uh, I have this one actually set in uh, genre specific. I had that one in, in my dubstep drum samples. Time to talk about the actual instruments in live. So uh, let's talk about the bass instruments here. Sort of cheesy sounding. But it's good to know the difference between these. Uh, basically what I've got here is I have an instrument rack where I've got more than one instrument in it. Both of them are playing at once. As you can see, they're, they're each doing different things. So that's a really nice, powerful feature of Ableton Live. It doesn't really exist in any other DAW that I've, that I've been able to find out about. Um, it allows you to take one set of MIDI notes and play them through a whole set of synths and get a really diverse, uh, full of character sound. Uh, and once you've added a few other effects onto it, such as filters and distortion and other things like that, you can get a really amazing, very unique sound. Um, even if you're only using presets to get things started with these, when you add two or three different presets together, you get a, a very unique sound in itself. And then once you tweak those presets a little bit to give you the the, um, the exact sounds that you're looking for out of each one of them and maybe add a little bit of EQ to each one of these to, to maybe say, all right, well, I want this one playing my highs and I want this one playing my mids and another one playing my lows, you can get an incredibly awesome, deep, complex sound. So I recommend playing around with that whenever you get a chance. Uh, the next section is we're going to talk about the... Um, sampler and the simpler. So the sampler is a, a neat feature that only comes with um, Ableton Live Suite, but one of the cool things that it does is it allows you to expand this little section here which is called the zone. And within that you can drop in a bunch of different samples and have them all play either at once or based on the key that you're playing on your keyboard or based on the velocity of how hard you're pressing the keys or based on a chain selector which is this little thing here and one of the nice things is you can automate that just like anything else in live well almost anything else in live so you can automate the sounds that you're playing from this sort of sound bank uh, based on the, the playing position of this thing so that's a really neat feature as well as, I mean, you can do a lot of really good uh, manipulation of the samples using um, this additional stuff in Sampler here that doesn't come with Simpler. There's LFOs, three different LFOs you can use, so um, it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful plugin. Simpler is quite a bit simpler, as you might uh, expect. Uh, you can change the start position and uh, the length, the total length of the track. Or of the of the sample you're uh, playing with here, change the volume, the panning, the stereo spread. It's basically got some of the same features that Sampler has, but it's uh, quite a bit um, more basic. So, recommend um, if you have Live Suite, play around with Sampler and compare and contrast the sample uh, the the features to the way that the Sampler works. And I'm sure you will find that um, Sampler, for the most part. Is, is what you're going to want to use in, in most cases.
Okay. Impulse. Um, this is a very, very simple sample player. You take individual drum samples and drop them into these parts here, and this gives you uh, a, a very, very basic, you know, an eight sample kit you can play from. And again, you can make little changes with these things here. Um, but in, unless you're um, having a really hard time understanding how the drum racks work, uh, the impulse is probably not something you're really going to need too much. Although, it is kind of a nice thing to have if you're going to be, say for instance, uh, doing live performance, and you want to have a sample bank that's set up to play little vocal samples like, Hey, ho, hey, DJ, hey, you, girl, get on the floor. Oh, wow, I hope I never say any of that ever again. Um, but it's nice to have little places that you can trigger samples from that aren't necessarily uh, full clips up here in, in this, because uh, basically you can set these up so that you can trigger them with keys that are otherwise unused on your MIDI controller for, I really hope none of you ever do this, but you could use it for making that stupid air horn sound that shows up almost everywhere nowadays. Um, you know, lots of things you could do with that. Um, oh, one thing that would be a useful thing, um, for instance, if you're, if you're playing like, uh, kind of a loungy set someplace and you want to be able to tell the people in the venue uh, your name and you know so you can have something like you're in the mix with DJ what's his face that kind of thing could be pre-recorded you could put some effects on it you know anyway it's a nice nice thing to have there um, collision is something that's a little more like it basically makes mallet sounds uh, this is this is a synthesizer is built into um, live and that could be um, used to make some more interesting um, here I could just show you what that sounds like not all that impressive um, but it, it it's it is really nice and clean um, so if you needed a sound like that and you can change some of the stuff around with this too to, to really get, you know get a difference in the, in the sound but for the most part it's gonna be very uh, mellow like that but there are tracks where you need something like that, especially if you're making ambient music. Uh, the drum rack, one of my favorite things to talk about. I have put in here as the default as the um, being the kit 808. This is the one that comes with live, uh, so you should be able to open this up and see how it works. Um, and it actually comes with, with these macro knobs pre-enabled and pre-mapped. So you can change a lot of what's going on in this kit and the way that the kit sounds by just changing those knobs. I've taken it a step further with this template and even gotten it to where by just by playing each one of these clips, it changes some of those parameters. Look in the clip envelopes here. If you follow along with me, you'll see the decay. The decay on drum one is set pretty low. On two, it's set in the mid-ish range. And on three, it's set almost all the way up at the top. The difference you'll hear in the sound is this very gentle kind of sound, right? Here everything has a little bit more length to it now. The sounds take longer to decay, which is what that means, that they, they are sort of sustaining a little bit longer. And when I play this one, you hear especially that, that really heavy 808 kick where it goes boom. That one's playing a long, long time after it is initially played because that decay is turned up. It's still played in this clip here, but you hear it fade out quite a bit quicker. So that is an excellent use of the um, clip envelopes to be able to make drastic changes to the way that that instrument sounds. And again, you can automate any parameters that you have macroed out to these macro knobs here using the clip envelopes for that channel. So that can we're, we'll get into some really cool stuff you can do with changing the way that a particular synth sounds by um, using chain selectors, by using uh, modulation of the synth parameters in itself, 
Uh, we can even use a macro knob where we're tying in uh, parameters from three or four different parts of that channel into one sort of uh, all-encompassing macro knob. Uh, that's actually why they're called macro knobs, to be able to do more than one thing at once. Um, but overall, these are set up uh, for very specific purposes in this particular drum kit, and in most cases, you'll, you'll probably be able to just leave them where they are. Um, but as you can see here, there's even more. Uh, you know, these, this is basically this is using an operator to make this kick and to make this kick. And basically, they're, all, all these instruments are being made with operator. Oh, I suppose that means I'm going to need to put in a uh, more basic drum kit for those of you who just have standard live. Um, okay. So, the drum racks. Uh, basically, when you were, if you put in a, I'm just going to create a new MIDI track here and show you what a drum rack looks like when we first put it in, because it's really boring looking. It's got nothing in it. It's helpful, I think, to expand these out to see what you're looking at. Um, but there's my, this is my, the, the bass note for uh, when, I, when I'm making a, a drum rack. Um, you can drop devices on here. So it could be uh, a synth, like what we were seeing with that drum rack the last one we were looking at, where it's basically using operator to create a synthesized 808 kick. Or we can use a sample. Or we could use a little bit of both. We could use a synthesizer to make the low part of the kick, and we could use a sample to make uh, the sort of punchier in your face part. I'll, I'll be going more into that in the drum synthesis parts of um, the tutorial series uh, later on. Uh, but basically, that's that's what makes this drum rack really, really powerful, is the fact that you can put multiple different things in here, and you could have a kick that is synthesized and a snare that's sam strictly sample based, and all these things can be doubled up, tripled up, quadrupled up. So, and lots of things can be automated to different parameters within there. So the drum rack is incredibly, incredibly powerful. Play around with that. Um, we will be actually having an entire um, series of modules in the um, in this tutorial series that are specifically dedicated to um, drum design, and we'll basically be doing almost all that strictly with the drum rack. Okay, going over to tension. Um, this is another synthesizer built into live. Um, just to give you an idea of what that sounds like. I've got it set up to make sort of a uh, somewhere between an electric guitar and uh, maybe it's an electric violin I guess. It sounds kind of like a violin with some distortion on it. Um, and that's that version of tension. I've got that sort of set up with those parameters. I have another um, instance of tension loaded in here that has a different sound. This one is. You can hear it's kind of have has a little bit of a percussive element to it. That's what's cool about tension is that it's that it's designed to emulate stringed instruments. And so if you get good at this, you can actually make it sound like all kinds of different stringed instruments that whether you're hammering on or um, you know I, I tend to think of this one as kind of reminds me of like a marble bouncing on a dulcimer string or something just a very strange sound but it um, put together with the other sounds in this um, in this rack makes a really interesting Electric is, is another another instrument. This is more like an electric mallet type instrument. I probably ought to turn that up a little bit, actually, since we can barely hear it next to the other ones. But what I'm doing here is I'm I'm changing the knob, uh, the macro knob. I'm, I'm changing its parameter, and and it is macroed to the chain selector here. And these 
bars you're seeing here, these colored bars, are showing you the where that instrument is going to play. If that bar, if the uh, the orange uh, indicator is hovering over a place where that bar exists, the instrument will play. Now, if it's turned down like that, that lighter blue color, um, and you can adjust those by using this little bracket mode here. You can adjust them from either end. That's what determines the volume that it's playing at. So, on this end, we're hearing this instrument, and we're hearing that instrument together, but we're not hearing that one because it's at the bottom end of that spectrum. Turn it up, and then suddenly we're no longer hearing that one, but we are hearing this one and that one. So that's the way the chain selector works. Uh, we'll get more into that in uh, designing synth leads, designing basses, um, macroing this along with other parameters of the synths further down the chain and even effects that are applied to the synths after they're played to give ourselves a, a much more robust and um, dynamic sound. So, um, another cool thing you can do is, again, automate that with clip envelopes, which is what I've done here. As you can see, it's going to move that up and down. So if I'm on this and I play that scene, Sorry, <laughs> I had that turned down. Yeah, if you have that turned down, it doesn't... If you have that turned down and that is an automated parameter, uh, when you try to go and play it, the automation will just not even come through at all. You actually have to have it turned up so that it has its full range, because basically the automation range is 0 to 127, and if that knob is set at 0, then it can't go anywhere. So, as you can hear now, Actually, I'll... so that's that's uh, one way to make a dynamic synth that you can modulate its different voices uh, over the time that you're playing it, um, or based on the clip that's playing. A lot of different things you can do with that. Okay, third-party plugins. Let's talk about um, what we can do with those. In this latest channel, we've got um, two different plugins. Uh, both are from Native Instruments. Uh, my favorite of the uh, plugin companies or plugin creator companies. Um, they also happen to make a ton of good hardware and a ton of good software. They, I just happen to really enjoy using their plugins with Ableton Live because. Uh, com combining their customizability with Ableton Live's um, automation potential makes for almost infinite possibilities in um, your sound dynamics. So Massive is a, a three oscillator synthesizer. Uh, there's, you can see them here. It's what they call a modular synthesizer because basically every one of these little boxes you're seeing here is another module you can add in and have it do its own thing. So you've got oscillators, you can modulate them using another oscillator, you can feed the signal back into itself, you can put, these are insert effects, but it basically puts the, the effect into the signal chain before it feeds it back on itself again. Filters where you can use you know, all different kinds of filter types to give you a, a unique sound. You can patch the sound of your uh, oscillators through your filters either in serial or in parallel uh, you can have each one of them going say just to filter one just to filter two or in the middle 
you can have your overall mix between your filters end up being a mix just of, of uh, filter one or filter two or somewhere in between. Uh, these are effects that are applied uh, right before the uh, signal leaves the the plugin and gets back out to your main system. Uh, these are macro control knobs that you can actually set up to control more than one parameter within here. For instance, this robot robotize here on, on this is actually controlling this parameter and this one. As you can see, it's one and it's, it's linked up with both of those. If I turn that up, it's actually going to turn, well, you, you won't see it vi happen visually, but what's happening is it's turning this one all the way from dry to wet and this pitch is going up just slightly. So, um, and all of these things, any knob, any parameter that you see on here, you can macro out to your macro knobs. You do that by selecting this little down arrow here and you can click on that configure button. Once that green light is lit, you can click on anything else and we'll just say this one for now. You click on it the first time and it'll add it to this little box down here. And you can just click on whichever ones you want and add a bunch of them in there. For instance, oh, I'm gonna add the cutoff and I'm gonna add the resonance. There we go. You deselect that to get out of that mode and then you can adjust those parameters right from here. And what's even more important is map them to macros. Okay, so that's massive, great synth, uh, very very robust, full of things. Especially, I mean, the library of presets you can get for this thing is just, forgive the pun, massive. And there, there's so many free uh, patch libraries you can get for this thing. I wouldn't recommend using presets in your music, but you can use them as a starting point. You can get yourself some good ideas about where you can go with your synths. Uh, for instance, you can start with something. Say, wow, I really need a dirty lead. And I want to, you know see what that sounds like. You start with a lead and say, okay. And that's actually the one that's that's set in this track is, is the, we're actually getting a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Put those two together and you get that really cool sort of hybrid. Cool stuff. All I've done there is picked one preset that I kind of liked in Massive on this one, and I have another preset loaded up in FM8 here, which is another Native Instruments synth. This one focuses on frequency modulated synthesis, which is a whole different beast. And I'll get more into that in a completely separate tutorial module, but basically there's an entire module that's just devoted to frequency modulated synthesis uh, because it is that in depth. Uh, but once you know how to do it, it's really, really powerful. So uh, we will cover that for sure. But basically all I've done here is I've just put those two things together. I've found um, two sounds that happen to work really well together. And um, other than maybe a little bit of tweaking of, of the parameters of those uh, of those presets, getting a little bit more customization. Um, we've pretty much gotten a, an awesome sound that when we play that sound by itself, I mean, we pl I should say play it along with the rest of the track. <laughs>
stuff. There's a lot of really amazing things you can do just by putting a few simple parts together into one um, instrument rack, as you're seeing here. So, play around with that, definitely. Um, okay, so, time to get into effects. All right. I have this effects channel set up over here because I wanted to be able to apply each one of these effects quickly as I go down the chain. And I'm basically going to be using, um, I've got the mod wheel on my um, keyboard mapped to macro 1. And I have the pitch bend wheel on the keyboard mapped to macro 2. And as you can see, it's changing parameters of this auto filter, which is one of the, the, fir the first one that I want to demo for you. But I have it macro. I have each one of those these macro knobs here um, set up to modulate parameters uh, of significance on pretty much all of these down the chain here. So you will see um, why this is important. So the uh, leads and the basses and the drums are all set up so that they're going to be playing all of their sound through just the effects channel. You can see where it says sends only. It's only going to output audio through this send knob, which is going to come out through there. Okay? So, if I play scene one, that auto filter is filtering out all the low frequencies, or sorry, all the high frequencies as I get it higher and higher. That kind of gated sound you're hearing there is the effect of this LFO, which is shaped like a square wave, and it's set up to do, um, right now it's doing eighth notes, now it's twelfth notes. 16th notes and that is because that uh, rate knob there is macroed to my pitch bend knob that I've got over here basically as it's it's um, it's set up to go opposite the direction of which way I turn the wheel um, and you change that by using this map mode button here. Once you've already set up some mappings and you've got your macro knobs kind of, you've got things doing more than one one thing at a time. Um, and you want to say have one knob go, you know, if you're turning one up, you want the other one to turn down. You click on map mode and you find the parameter you want to modulate and it'll highlight it for you. And then you adjust whatever you want the minimum and the maximum to be. If you want it to be opposite of everything else, you basically turn up the one that's on the bottom and turn down the one that's on the top. There you go. So that's how that works. Auto pan. I didn't actually set up any uh, automation stuff for this. But as you can see, it's basically panning back, well, you, pro you can probably hear it, actually. It's panning back and forth between left and right channels here. I can go a little bit more and make it go really extreme on the left-right channels. I can also make it go faster back and forth. Uh, you know, hell with it. I'm going to map this to macro 1. And I'm going to take this raid and map it to macro 2. Fun stuff you can do with auto pan. Beat repeat is basically a glitch plugin. What's happening here is you're seeing a graphical representation of the bar, um, which is the uh, the length of music that's playing. Wherever that yellow area shows up, that's the area that was going to be glitched or beat repeated. The grid, um, what you see there as the... Um, 
the amount, the, basically the number of glitches that it's going to do per time or through. Um, I don't really spend a whole lot of time going through all this stuff, but... But it's a fun plugin to play with, um, and it's especially good for live DJ stuff. Chorus. Much like a guitar chorus pedal. This is a compressor. I'm going to stop the music for a minute because there's a little bit of this to explain. Um, the way a compressor works is it takes the quiet parts of the sound that's being put through it and turns them up. And it takes the loud parts of the sound that's coming through it and tries to turn them down. There's also a way to modulate the compressor based on sound input coming from another channel. Uh, in dance music, especially some of the more uh, recent trends in dance music where the... Um, bass lines tend to be incredibly heavy um, leaving them in the track by you know just the way that they would be normally makes it so that most of the time they would end up overpowering your kick drum and the kick drum is what keeps the beat and you don't want that to get lost so what we do is we set up a side chained compressor which means that we're taking the input from the drum uh, the kick drum and we're using that to modulate the how like how much the compressor is being applied to the incoming signal from the bass so i will play just the um just the bass line here <laughs> So, you can see how that output is coming through there. Watch what happens when I kick the drums in. That right there, the threshold that you're seeing, that's representing every time the kick drum is played. Listen to this. You turn that little headphone thing on. Basically, it's it's gonna tell it's gonna let you listen to exactly what it's hearing from its side chain. What I've done here is I've mapped that to the audio from the drum rack, and to be more specific, within that drum rack, I've gone to the 808 kick pre effects, meaning meaning you want to grab the sound of the kick drum before any effects are applied to it in the system. Gives you the cleanest sound. So, um, that essentially makes sure that whenever the kick drum plays, the bass line will sort of duck out of the way. And uh, we'll get more into headspace and sound design further down in the tutorial courses. But one of the most important things to understand about how sound design works and how getting a, a good mix uh, works is that every sound that you have in your mix takes up a certain amount of room. So if you have a kick drum that you need to come through, you can't have it playing at the same time as a bass note that's playing in the same frequencies or it's going to sound all muddy. You may not even be able to hear the kick at all. So putting that compressor in there allows us to make, make that Bass, uh, the bass line get out of the way just long enough for the kick drum to come through and then the bass line comes right back in where it was supposed to be. Um, okay. Moving right along. This is an EQ8. This is an equalization plugin that allows you to turn up or down certain portions of the sound. What I'm doing here is adjusting the gain of a particular 
point on the frequency spectrum. So if I turn it up here, and the, the pointiness of that shape is determined by the Q here. It's really useful for accentuating parts of your mix that you want to stand out, or for surgically removing certain parts of the sound that are just nasally or too resonant or resonating in the wrong frequencies, or if you have some noise that's coming through and you know that it's in a particular frequency uh, range, you can just cut them right out using this like a scalpel. That's also that's that's a very popular way to add things like glitch um, effects to to tracks and having more than one of those things kind of moving around on a sound. Okay, flanger. <laughs> Very similar to a flanger guitar pedal. All right. This one's going to take a little bit of explanation as well, so I'm um, going to pause the music. The gate is a very simple plugin that leads to a very diverse number of different things you can do with it. Um, essentially, what this does is it allows the sound from this whatever's coming through here to pass only when it is told to allow it to pass. So I've set this up with a side chain so that it's taking audio from a trigger pre-effects. Now I didn't talk about triggers yet and I mentioned earlier that I was going to tell you why these things are turned off earlier. And the reason that is is because these are set up with a very very simple plugin. It's analog which is a synth in Ableton and it's set up to play nothing but noise and it's set up to play noise exactly as long as that key is pressed and no longer um, like this uh... now that's a very harsh noise we don't want that in our mix but what we do want it for is generating a signal this is a carrier wave, basically. When this clip is playing, that analog synth is making that white noise, and it's being heard, but not by you or not by the listener, but it is being heard by this Gator plugin. It hears that series of white noise notes, and it allows notes from this channel, which is whatever is playing on here, to come through according to that. So watch how this works if I play, um, let's just say this bass. Okay, so that's playing along with this MIDI set of notes. What happens if I do this? Or this one. It's more obvious if I... Uh, solo that. So as you can see, that's a really useful way to add some character to your synth lines without having to go through all the effort of actually drawing those notes in that way. You can give a very simple melody line here and then and then sort of chop it up using a gate effect side chained to a trigger. 
I put three trigger channels in on this uh, on this template because I found triggers to be so useful across the board with all my different instruments that sometimes I want up to three different channels to be gated and triggered by three different trigger um, events. Uh, so feel free to play around with that as much as you want. This is a very, very powerful and, and, uh, and fun tool to play around with, um, especially considering the fact that without that, it's really, really hard to make um, glitch effects using just the synth itself because most of the time the synth doesn't have a, a built-in gate that will really evenly chop off the end of those notes like that. You basically, if you wanted to, I mean, what you're looking at is it's basically shaping the wave like this square here. It's an immediate attack, an immediate decay, or a, a immediate release so that it's 100% um, on as soon as you press the key and 100% off as soon as you let go of it. And it makes for a very crisp effect doing it that way. Okay, um, back to the effects here. The limiter. You're not going to see really how this affects um, things right now, so I won't even bother um, playing things. But this should be used very sparingly. Um, this basically allows you to kind of um, prevent any audio that's coming through this channel from clipping. Uh, clipping is what happens when the audio is too loud and it overloads the um, audio outputs on your sound card or on any audio system you happen to be playing through. Um, clipping is something that even will occur w when you render your track out so that if, it, if it's clipping on your internal audio equipment and then you um, you render the track as a as a WAV file, and then you go play that anywhere else. It doesn't matter if you play it at half volume; it'll still be clipping. So, a limiter is a way to help prevent that from happening. Although it is somewhat a limiter is clipping the audio in a sense anyway. It just does it in a sort of gr a, a graceful way or somewhat graceful. Um, it's more graceful the less you use it. Uh, so you know if your if your signal is coming through and it's popping down into this range down here that it's showing that it's limited, you have you really need to go through your channels and back your um, back these down. Or actually, one thing that might be a good idea to do in those situations would be to go through and and um, just add a utility plugin, which is another one that I'm going to show you how to use in a second. Um, and then uh, turn your volume knobs down by the same amount on each one of your tracks all the way through until you're no longer hitting the limiter really heavily. I would say you only want like 1 or 2 dB of, uh, of limiting at your peak times in the track uh, if you're going to have a limiter on your, um, on your track. Anything more than that, and, and it's going to end up sounding um, flattened. So... Overdrive is a distortion plugin. Let's hear what that sounds like. Fun stuff there. Phaser, again, similar to probably what you might have experienced on a guitar pedal if you've ever played around with a phaser. Another really good one for uh, live DJing. Ping pong. This is a type of delay, a very specific type of delay. Um, and it's got this cool filter built in. Anyway, reverb. Remember this one from earlier? We set these ones up over here. The smaller the size, the smaller the room. 
Saturator. Another form of distortion. Simple delay. We talked about this. This is the one we've got set up on those delays up there. Um, what's cool is you can actually set it up so that it's it plays the left and right channels differently. So the left channel here is set up on uh, four beats, and the right channel is set up on six beats. Cool effect. Spectrum. Just gonna take a little explanation. Um, this plugin doesn't actually change the sound at all. What it does do is lets you see visually exactly where on the spectrum the sounds that are coming through this channel are falling. And helps you identify the peaks. It can help you identify the key that those peaks are in. As you can see, these little numbers that show up down here, as I hover over a particular area, it's showing me where the dB range is, so like what the... Uh, amplitude of that is. This is showing me the uh, frequency in hertz or kilohertz. Um, but then the part down here tells me the actual key that it's in on a piano key, which can be really helpful if I want to use it to help me like tune a drum sample. For instance, um, if you're making, uh, say, you're making like a Latin house kind of track, you're gonna have a lot of toms and other um, drum type instruments in there that'll have a lot of their own tonality to them, a lot of their own sort of noteness. Um, and if you just throw the samples in there willy nilly, uh, they will probably not follow along with the melody of your track. But using something like this spectrum, you can play a drum sample over here, watch for where that peak falls, and say, oh, this is in F, and my track is in D. So I need to detune it a little bit, a couple semitones down. Done. And then that uh, that's a really useful feature for that. It's also useful for looking for um, places that you have uh, resonant parts, uh, things that you can go, oh, you know, that doesn't sound so good. You could put one of these in combination with one of those EQ8s that we had earlier and use them as tools uh, simultaneously to find and eliminate your... Um, annoying sounds, or to find and boost the key elements of a sound. So that's what's um, useful about that. Okay, let's play some more here. Uh, the utility plugin. Um, I'm just going to go back to playing the standard. Utility is a very simple looking plugin, but it's got a lot of features that you can work with. Uh, one being the panorama. Oh, I suppose I need to uh, set this back to sentence only so that it really. There we go. So you can see it's quite drastic. But that's that's um, utility for you. Uh, this is the part I was telling you about earlier where you can put one of these on like, basically every channel. And if you're hitting that limiter and having a hard time with it, go through every one of your channels and turn this down by like 5 or 10 dB. And then start turning it back up slowly from there. Uh, width is basically the stereo uh, potential of this track. If I set this to 0, The, if, if I leave it in uh, pan to center, it will have no stereo quality. Um, as you can probably hear, as I turn that width up, the sound is going way, way out to the sides. Usually you want to leave it at 100, but there are some specific circumstances where this can come in really handy. For instance, um, in a drum rack, 
pretty much you always want your kick drums to be uh, mono center. So the way you would do that is you'd add a utility to like your drum rack here. Uh, you would go to your, this is your tom, or your, your, your kick, I guess it would be in this case, you'd add to the kick. You'd go down over here and you'd add a um, utility, and you'd crank that width all the way down to zero to get you the, the uh, most mono signal you possibly can on that kick drum. Because you want that kick to be big and fat and coming right down the center of the stereo field. Um, because you want, you want, no matter what, for that kick drum to be um, very audible for your listener. And in systems where they've only got the subwoofer running off of one side or the other, having it come down the center guarantees that it's going to hit both. Okay. Back to our effects. I think we only have, yeah, we have one more. Um, let me just play this. Okay, that concludes the Ableton effects. I wanted to go real quick into some third-party effects that um, these are free effects you can get from Tal, which is Togu Audio Line, T-O-G-U Audio Line. Um, and they're available for Mac and Windows. Some cool stuff you can do with these. I've actually got these um, these things set up so that they're controlling parameters within here, like this. So if I play a it's a, it's a bit crusher. Relatively popular effect. Um, that one may need a little more tweaking before it's uh, club system ready. This is a, uh, a tube distortion effect. I'll play that. This is a dub effect. Dub meaning uh, sort of that that uh, dance hall descendant of uh, of reggae. Those probably sound fairly familiar. Um, those are, again, free plugins you can get, and there's actually a whole bunch of them, like 10 or 12 or something like that. Free plugins you can get from the developer that makes these ones, and they're just, they're great quality, great fun to play around with, and if you don't have a lot of extra cash, it's a, it's a fantastic way to get your hands on some, some good tools. Okay. Um, last but not least, Live's Preferences window. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's in here that you probably didn't know was there, especially if you're brand new. Um, so we'll go straight from the top. Look and feel. Um, in case you dismiss a dialogue at some point, you go, oh my gosh, I need to go back and change that thing. You can restore the don't show again uh, warnings, and you'll go through all of them again and be able to choose the option that you wanted uh, to begin with. Um, display zoom. I've found 80% to be a really good sweet spot for me because it lets me see more of the screen. Watch what happens if I change this value. If I were to have this 100% on this screen, look how little screen real estate I actually have to work with here. This is a 1080p screen I'm, I'm working on here. So, you know, overall in terms of computer monitors, it's not the highest resolution screen. Um, but it is big. It is a 40-inch monitor. So I can go with a, with a lower um, zoom display number there and still be able to see everything because it's basically right in my face gives me way more ability to be able to see the big picture um, and as long as you're not straining your eyes really that's the only thing that that, uh, that matters here so find a, a setting that is 
um, small enough to accommodate a lot of stuff on the screen so you don't have to be scrolling around and collapsing and expanding things all the time, wasting time doing those things, but finding a, a sweet spot where it's still, you can see everything easily without hurting your eyes. Also, find a color that is well suited to the time of day that you're wanting to produce and sort of the mood that you want to create for the track even. You know, if you're making, oh geez, why would anybody ever use that? Oh, that's worse. There's a couple of these that, like this one, could be useful if you're working real late at night and you're just, you want to keep the your, ex, your exposure to uh, brighter lights on your eyes uh, minimal. Um, but experiment with different ideas and how you want it to look. I stick with blue because it tends to be a, a nice cool color palette, but not too cool and not too hot. It's Goldilocks blue. Okay. Um, experiment around with these things here. Kind of get to your preference about how whether you want to have multiple plug-in windows open or not. Um, okay. Audio settings. You don't really need to pay attention to this because this is set up just so that I can record this session um, and you can hear everything all at once. But changing your buffer size uh, changes your latency. And you generally want your, your goal is to get it as close to zero as possible. Um, this just happened to be right on the money this time. Um, but yeah, you, you want to get that latency as close to zero as possible. Um, if you are going to be using external control surfaces like an LPD-8 or an APC-40 or a MIDI keyboard, you'll be wanting to turn these things on or off. Um, there's stuff in the Ableton Live uh, manual about how to do that. We don't really need to cover that too much, but this is where all that is. Once you, uh, One of the things that's going to save you the most amount of time when you've been working on Live is having a default set that you start up with and it gives you everything that you want to have in your workspace when you fire up live to beginning uh, to begin with it will drastically cut down on the amount of time you spend setting things up every time you start a new project so um, I highly recommend starting with one of the templates that I'll provide and then changing things around the way you want it finding what works for you and what doesn't and then once you come to something that seems like a really good starting point where you want everything to um, you want that to be your basis. Once you've got that open, you just hit save as default, and it will put that as your default template. Every time you open live from that point on, unless you're opening a particular set, it will open with that template. I actually recommend saving the template that you end up deciding on as a separate file besides just setting it as your current default so that just in case you accidentally set something else as your default later on, you don't end up losing all those settings. Um, I keep a separate folder of just template sets um, in my Ableton Projects folder. Um, analysis files are basically when uh, Ableton has a warping engine built into it that allows you to speed up or slow down tracks. Uh, that you're there are samples that you're importing and the analysis file is basically um, a, a way that live can store all of the detailed analysis uh, information that it's done on those files um, so that it doesn't have to store all that in RAM uh, let's see here you don't really need to do a lot with sample editors um, most of this stuff oh um, if you install a VST while Ableton Live is running, you're going to have to hit the rescan button so it can find it. Um, also, if you have custom inform um, places where you're keeping all your VSTs or AUs, you have to tell it where to find them specifically. Um, okay, thanks. The file type that you're recording in, um, in Max it has the option to be AIFF or WAV. I choose AIFF because it allows me to actually insert tags into that file. For instance, artist, title, year of release, album, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if I'm submitting a uh, lossless, uh, basically if I if I want to send in like a remix competition or something, and I want them to have the highest quality version I could possibly send them, I set it up as an AIFF and I go in there and tag it myself uh, before I send it into them. Wave files, unfortunately, do not have the ability to retain um, tagging information. 
So sad. So that's why I have that set as mine, but that's really all that means. Um, having these exclusive things turned on means that um, if I have one soloed and then I go click another one, it turns the other solo one off unless I hold down that Apple button or the control button on PC. Same thing goes with the arm button. Um, I'll leave it turned on that way so that I don't have to manually go around and uncheck the ones that I've been doing, but it's all at your personal preferences. The default warp mode, I set it as complex on mine because that t tends to be the one that gets the best quality. Uh, that is not by, all, by any means a rule. It is mo just kind of a, the, the, the majority of the time it ends up being the best. Um, but uh, in most cases, if you're doing like a vocal sample, you're going to want to go with one that's not even in this um, list. There's one that's called Complex Pro, um, which you can select from, there's a drop down if you're in over here, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if this were a, an audio um, file, you'd, you'd see the warp information over here and there'd be a little drop down where you could choose to um, change the, uh, you could use to change the uh, warping engine from Complex to Complex Pro, which is the one that's better for vocals. Other than that, if it's if it's drum beat, just a drum beat, like a drum loop, um, beats is good. Experiment around with the different ones you've got there and, and see which one sounds the best. You're going to know which one sounds the best. It'll, it'll immediately jump out at you. Um, okay, and CPU stuff. If you've got a multi-core processor, which I really hope you do, have that turned on. Just turn it on. It'll be so much easier for you. Um, if you don't have a multi-core processor, see if you have a processor that has what's called hyper-threading uh, available. Uh, you may have to go into your BIOS settings to turn it on, uh, but if that is available, it will drastically improve the performance, even though you're not doing anything to actually add another processor to your computer. It just changes the um, way that that processor interacts with the operating system, and having that turned on gives you way more um, parallel processing capabilities, so it can actually do more than one thing at once. That concludes it. Um, thank you so much for watching this tutorial video. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, I hope it's very useful to you. Um, do check out the links at the bottom of the screen there um, for more information about this this course, the um, other videos that are going to come after it. Um, also, uh, I am a producer myself. If you'd like to check out my music, you can find it at uh, soundcloud.com slash blendrix. That's B-L-E-N-D-R-I-X. You can also find me on Facebook with the same name, Twitter with the same name, and uh, Tumblr with the same name, pretty much any of the social networks. You can find me there, too. Uh, do hit me up there and um, let me know if you have any questions you have, any feedback you have about the courses. Uh, you can also leave comments in the video below. Um, all right. Well, I hope that's been helpful to you. Please send me feedback. I'd love to make improvements on it, too. All right. Have a good one.